This is the Wally and Mathot Show, powered by Barhaven Ford. Now here are your hosts, Brent Wallace and Mark Mathot. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Wally and Mathot Show, powered by Barhaven Ford. Just a reminder, they have got inventory in there. The brand new Bron- Broncos are there, the F-150s. They've got Explorers and Escapes all in stock. Go see them. 555 Dealership Drive in Barhaven or... Of course, you can always visit them online at barhavenford.com. They're all shiny and new, just like Mark Mathot is shiny and new. Hey, Matthew, you must be coming in here. It's first day of training camp. You're probably 10 pounds heavier and in the best shape of your life to do this show today, I'm guessing. <laughs> it kills me. It kills me every time I hear that. And, and again, I think I think the media is starting to catch on to it because I know a lot of people were making fun of those, those one-liners that we hear every year. It's exhausting. Year. That way, you know what? I won't even get into it now. We'll save it for later. But it's it I, I'm like it's wild to me that it, it, could you imagine being the player that came into camp? And go, I'm not ready. I you know what this year isn't my year, and I'm not ready. In fact, I've well, gained I gained 25 pounds. And I find it I find it funny because when I first got into the NHL, that was the thing. Like as a defenseman or a bigger guy, you needed to put on weight. And and really, when I look back now, it did nothing for me. It did nothing for me. Um, and, and, and I think that's even more true now in that the game is just speed. So to suggest that a player should put on 14 pounds, especially a veteran, for example, like that makes no sense. And a player is going to lose that within the first couple months anyway. I think it comes down to some of these young kids that are just developing a little more and growing into their bodies might be putting on a little weight in the summer. But that's that's an exception. One of the things I think of that gets lost, maybe and you can help me out here, is it's not the added weight. It's the strength, right? It's just the simple yeah, core strength. Sure. Like I remember Chris Neal dropped weight. I think he was stronger by the end of it. Yeah. And well, you're playing hockey. You're not a linebacker. So you need to be able to move out there on a tiny little blade. So adding 20 pounds of muscle, even if it is in fact muscle, which is incredibly doubtful in a three month off season, um, you know, it's just, it doesn't help you. So I think, you know, if you're just working hard, you're doing a lot of conditioning, you're going to be in a good place come training camp. But to be honest with you, you can never replicate any of the on ice stuff with the off ice stuff. You can train as hard as you like, but when it comes to the skating, that's where you got to do the work in the summer. So the, for the last few weeks, right before camp would start, that's when you'd have your strength coach come on the ice and you're doing bagging, dr- bag drills, you're skating as hard as you can, just to try to get into somewhat game shape, because it's really the only way to get prepared for it. And speaking of on ice, the Sens are on ice today as the rest of the NHL is a day one of training camp of on ice activities gets underway uh, with a notable absence today, Matt, as we've talked about ad nauseum, and I'm not sure what else is new, but I will ask you this, yeah. and that is as a player, when you don't have arguably your best player, well, at least call him the best forward on the team, is it a distraction or do you really even notice it or care? Yeah, like he's he's definitely your most impactful player when it comes to the Ottawa Senators, I believe, and I don't think that's, an, that's a, a contentious thing to say. I, I just... I think if you're a teammate of his or you're a player, you're not too concerned about it right now, at least. I think most players are probably holding some high hopes that it will get done. Um, I believe his brother, it took about 11 days of training camp that he missed before he finally signed in Matthew Kachuk. So, uh, I, you know, I feel like this is a very similar situation. And, and at the end of the day, all you can control is yourself. So if you're a teammate of Brady's right now, maybe a line mate, you might be a little irritated because it kind of screws things up in practices and you want to get reps in with your liney. But other than that, it's just noise. It's outside noise, and it will get settled. I think people just need to calm down a little bit. And I think most of the players, if I'm not mistaken, are just trying to earn a spot. So they really aren't invested in what Brady could is doing, except we'll call the one guy that gets the biggest promotion and where it affects the most, and that's Nick Paul. And, hey, I'm all for it, deservedly so. I would put him there in a heartbeat. I think it's the right move. You've got to feel kind of good for Nick Paul, who goes from – waivers to healthy scratch to not know if he has a job to now at least and i'm not saying he's a first line left winger no. but he's in that spot because well, he's and, and yeah ex- exactly and i'm happy you brought that up wally because he's 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 essentially taken like a hard route that i can relate to as far as going up and down paying your dues in the american league which can be really difficult as a player and and then of course ends up finally having a really breakout year last season and then furthermore goes to the world championships gets the golden goal Gets a lot of success, a lot of confidence. I know we've been teasing him about the golden goal nonstop, especially (laughs) during the golf tournament, but um, I'm happy for him because you know what? He's a utility player. He really is. You can play him in different roles when you need him to. And when there's, when there are injuries, 
He can bump up in the lineup because he's not a liability defensively. And as we've seen last season, he can he can lug the puck now. He can make plays. So, you know, is he Brady Kachuk? No, he's a different player. But you can have him up there for now, fills that little void until, or big void rather, until they get Brady all signed up. Do you think because of the success he's had in the last season and a half or whatever, that his confidence level is actually what's fueling his success right now? Does, am, am, am I yeah. making too big a deal of this? No, I, I, I think from, from, from experience now, I can honestly and firmly say that confidence is king in professional mm-hmm. sports. And we know this because there's so much parity. You've got a ton of AHL guys that are fully capable and just as skilled to play at that next level as well, but they don't always come with a ton of confidence. And so that's what separates a lot of NHL players from minor leaguer players that, that perhaps never make that jump up. So with Nick Paul right now, he's in a really good spot. He's very confident. I know he's an absolute machine off the ice, takes very good care of himself. His quads were bursting out of his shorts, the golf tournament <laughs> guys were giving him a hard time, especially Chris Neal. And um, and, and he's just he's just that guy right now that I think you can really lean on for a lot of these different roles. I feel like we're going to see him on the PK a little bit more now. He's able to play center. That's always a potential, too, if you need him to shift over to the middle. So, I mean, I, I'm really excited for him, and I have some high hopes for Nick Paul this season. We'll get to that center in just a moment. I will say the Nick Paul thing at the golf tournament, even my kid made fun. He goes, Nick Paul's shorts are really tight. <laughs> yeah, they, um, were, they were really tight, yeah. <laughs> uh, speak now, yesterday – uh, General Manager Pierre Dorian called him the disciple, as in Nick Paul. If you're yeah. in that room and you hear a teammate called the disciple, where is this going? He will never, I'm going to assume, live this down. Can I get a little context here? Why why are they calling him the disciple? Because he does everything right and he follows along and he like he's just a <laughs> disciple of the program. I mean, so hey, it's, it's a flattering. compliment of upper proportions if you're a management, but I'm just thinking yeah. if you're a teammate like Austin Watson, this is the last thing you need is just a little fuel to the fire. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you know what though, like beyond all of that, anytime you get a little bit of praise from not only your coach, but a general manager, that's huge. It's, I, it, it just is. And, and so again, confidence, this is just good for his confidence you want to make sure he doesn't take a step back, though. And again, that's that's all that's always going to be a bit of a concern. But he's been around long enough. I'm pretty sure he knows how to manage his game. We saw him switch it up at a world stage and still maintain that consistency. So again, I, I'm not concerned. But as far as him being a disciple, if you will, I guess just run with it at this point. I'm sure the guys will make fun of him, though. Uh, our Sens Camp is brought to you by BEI, Bonisher Excavating Inc., helping to shape the Ottawa Valley. Visit BonisherExcavating.com. Uh, great people and do fantastic work in the Ottawa Valley. Okay, I, speaking of fantastic work, and this is going to be a contentious issue uh, here in camp, and that is the second-line center spot. Chris Tierney uh. right now, he gets targeted as saying that he's going to fill that spot. Now, we are day yeah. one of camp. I don't think this lineup is going to be anywhere near set when it comes to center. Is this... Chris Tierney spot to lose after uh, management is not high on Chris Tierney. I don't think that that's any secret whatsoever. Shane Pinto, is this just kind of a little push for him to make sure he's not resting on his laurels thinking he's going to get the second line center spot. And of course, is this just a little bit of a shot to Logan Brown to say, Hey, we're pegging Chris Tierney here as the guy, not necessarily the young ones. You make some really good points, particularly door number two and door number three with Logan Brown. I think that, in this situation, if you're going to set in, like, and this is very commonplace for, for training camps. I know that from my experiences playing, you'll look at the, the, the lines that, that are structured up there, the coach put together, and you're not always going to be placed as the young guy immediately given that top spot. So I think for Shane Pinto right now, it's an opportunity to, to earn that spot. Nothing is given to you at this level. And, and Tierney's been around. Right now, they're going to have him up there. Do I believe he'll be a second line player on this team? No, I don't. I really don't. But I know that he's fairly reliable and that right now for training camp, at least to begin with, you've got him in that slot. He can fill that up. But again, if I'm the coach right now, if I'm DJ Smith, I'm watching attentively during training camp, I'm paying attention to Shane Pinto. And if Pinto's playing really well, you you quite frankly just have to give him that spot to start because we saw how all these experiments worked out last year with older players, maybe playing a little bit ahead of where they should be in the lineup. Pinto proved himself very small sample size, of course, but between him and Logan Brown right now, 
They're going to be under the microscope during training camp. Tierney will be in that slot for now to fill that void. But you're not going to have Pinto on your fourth line playing fourth line minutes. He's not built for that. He's a second line planer. So it's either second line or bust for Shane Pinto. He's not going to start the season here on that second line center. You can expect him down in Belleville. That's just the way this game works. Okay, but it, it points out a couple of different things. One is that Ottawa's really thin down the middle of the ice. That we're Very talking thin. That, that Chris Tierney is going to be labeled as partic- possibly the second line center. But I will give uh, Tierney some props. Let's go through a couple of the numbers. He's played the most of any player for the Ottawa Senators oh, yeah. in the last three seasons. 207 games. He's missed one due to illness. Uh, yep. He is third in points over those three seasons with 104 points. He's played, uh, when you look at assists in 2018-19, he was second in assists with 39. Like, he can play. I think if he's yes. given some minutes, we might be able to see a different Chris Tierney who's not hurt as he was last year with the back injury. He did look slow. He didn't look himself. Maybe... Yeah. Chris Tierney's better than we want to give him a little bit of credit for. Right. I, oh, and, and I, this isn't a slight to Chris Tierney. I just think that he is – I don't believe he's the second-line center at the in the NHL at this point in his career. Yeah. I'd like to see him on that third or fourth line to start, probably, uh, only because – I mean, at face value, when you look at the lineup, you think, okay, this might work. But then when you look across the NHL and all the teams they're going to be playing against and all those second line centers, or or rather second lines in general with the wingers, there's a lot of speed there. And I don't know that he can keep up. Again, that's only an assumption. I'm going to have to watch some exhibition games to make a real, uh, give an honest review on it. But for now, based off of what I've seen, I know he was injured. I, I worry about foot speed at that level on that second line, but we'll see for now. It's it realistically, in my opinion, is Shane Pinto's spot to lose. I know that they've got Tierney slotted up there right now, but I think as training camp progresses and Pinto starts playing very well, assuming he does, we'll probably see him right back up there. All right. So something that we keep talking around or avoiding or ignoring is Colin White. So mm. can Colin White, who was penciled in two years ago, three years ago, as this team's second line center, can he not yeah. play that spot? Oh, I don't know, Wally. That's a tough, that's a really tough one. I, I, he, he, there's a lot of potential there. And I think that he's, he's right there as far as breaking out. Uh, he's been getting, given a lot of opportunities and cer- certainly yeah. been compensated with a really good contract. But uh, again, to me, Colin White is a third line guy right now. And I don't see him making any progression, getting up onto that second line. It's just not for him. I think he's just a victim of a high price tag. Good for him. I'll never get I'll never give it to a player for getting what he, you know, what he gets as far as contract goes and dollar signs. Good for him. But um, right now that third line with Formington white and Ennis, assuming that's what's going to happen. I think that's a far cry from what we're, what the reality will be, but that, that is not a nice looking third line to have. So I, I'd like to see some line shuffling, but all that'll change once Brady gets signed. Right. So it really, it goes back to our first topic. If Brady signs the entire structure of this lineup is looking a lot different. So for now, we can only speculate. But I think this lineup looks completely different. I don't know if completely, I guess, is the word. But you have been around long enough to know going into training camp, we always talk about, oh, these young stars are going to be in the lineup and they're going to be playing on opening night and they're look where they are penciled in on day one and then you never see them again. Like Bobby mm. Butler is a classic example who was tore it up in an exhibition game and we never saw because you know day one of training camp to day one of the regular season is a whole different world oh, when it comes man. to speed, skill, how the NHL operates is not even close. I can't, you nailed it, Wally. I can't stress that enough for people listening. You can even, exi- not, forget about development camp, rookie camp, but even an exhibition game, I can tell you that the pace night and day from a real regular season yeah. NHL game, exhibition games are almost kind of just like a way to feel things out. Not everyone's finishing their checks. A lot of the younger players that are trying to break in, a lot of them are maybe a little apprehensive around the veterans. They're not going to be taking runs at guys. I I remember just going from an exhibition game that was kind of a walk in the park to a regular season game where all of a sudden everyone's finishing their checks and it was a brutal wake up call. So uh, again, it's really tough to make an assessment. And that's why, you know, coaching staff, They've got a, they've got the general, they got the general manager, the assistant GM. They got a lot of scouts in the stands during training camp because you really do have to pay very close attention because, as we all know, the games are significantly different. So I think it's going to be a really tough job. And 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 as a young player, this is be my last point. You really got to try to just 
not over, or how do I word this? You don't want to give too much respect to your opponents in exhibition games. You got to put that all at the window. If you want to make that jump to the NHL level, you got to make a splash early. And it starts immediately in that first exhibition game. You're going to finish all your checks. It doesn't matter if it's Shea Weber or a first year guy, you got to finish them. You just have to, because play, a coaching staff and general managers want to make sure that you look confident out there. You're not kind of maybe pulling your punches, uh, you know, for, for lack of a better term, and that you're playing very confident. So that's a big adjustment for a lot of these guys. And that's where your leadership comes in. And you got to talk to these young guys in the lineup and give them that kind of advice so that they can apply it when they, when they start in these games. You, you spoke of punches and this is off topic, but do you remember the old days of the preseason exhibition games when there was oh. everybody trying to send a message. So there was like, everyone was fights. fighting. <laughs> <laughs> it was crazy. We would play in Columbus and I was like 17, my first training camp turning 18, I should say. And uh, we would play against Nashville in the practice rink in Columbus at nationwide arena. And it was just a, it was a, it was a gong show. And like these teams, they were bringing in tough guys just for preseason. Like there was no intention of even having them in the organization, but it was just like this giant pissing match between NHL teams who had the tougher guys. And it, I, I, I didn't understand it at the time. Thankfully the game has changed away from that because it was, yeah. it was a bit of a circus, but yeah, the game's, the game's looking a lot different now than it was even 15 years ago. Uh, I just remember there would always just be a yard sale every other shift. Anyway, oh, yeah. um, getting, Getting back on topic, Pierre Dorian did say yesterday, uh, among other things, quote, we lost some goals, so we'll be looking for goals from someone. There could be spots open on the top two lines. Hmm. Other than the second line center, really, are there any spots open? Not, I mean, you've got Norris no. and Batherson in the top line, then Stutzla and Connor Brown, and of course, when Brady Kachuk signs, like, they're just looking for a second line center. But you're, I don't think that they're going to find one anytime soon, just floating around on the open market as we get set to start <clears> the season. No, I mean, if, do you know how hard it is to find a top two centerman, let alone a top four D man? They're almost in, they're almost two in the same, right? As far as, first of all, you're gonna have to throw the kitchen sink at another team to actually acquire a player of that caliber, which of course, Ottawa has some pieces, but I mean, are you willing to get rid of a couple first rounders and perhaps a ready to go top six guy up front? Like you're just not going to find that. So right now, thankfully for the Ottawa Senators, they're not necessarily in a, we're going to win the Stanley Cup this year mode. Uh, so a little patience is still going to be required. You're still going to get some growing pains. Of course, if somebody turns up, I think Pinto, we keep mentioning Pinto, that would be the ideal situation. He's very young and you hate to put that much responsibility on a guy and you have to be very careful with the confidence factor where you don't want to destroy him early on in his career. You want to make sure you're still kind of grooming him up to be that second line guy for now. But again, you're not going to find a top two center anywhere right now. All your answers are within the organization, and that's just the sobering truth. Jack Eichel? <laughs> I don't see it. I don't see it. I, I really don't. I mean, I mean, he, he's, he's absolutely a top 10, arguably, I should say, a top 10 player in the NHL right now. He's still elite. His numbers back it, whether you like yeah. to admit it or not. But between the injury, Wally, that neck thing, man, that scares me. And they're talking about fusions back there now. The team still wants to do a fuse with his neck. I mean, I just, I know how invasive that surgery is and he's still relatively young, but uh, man, the uh, recovery on that is basically at least half a season. It's going to be serious. Yeah. Yeah. No, I was just, just, I know you're kidding, but, um, but, but, but there's a little weight to it. I've seen the name floating around quite a bit in Sen's Twitter. So it's worth talking about at least. Uh, coming up, we've got Igor Sokolov who's going to stop by in the whitewater chat. Now, interesting comments. Maybe I should save it till after the interview, but, I'm just going to do it now anyway, then is um, DJ Smith saying we're going to give him every opportunity to make the team. But at the end of the day, this is about having a team that's good for 10 years. And what makes Igor Sokolov the best player? Uh, does that mean Igor Sokolov is not going to be anywhere near this roster at the start of the season? Well, I, I think it's, I think it might be, it, it, how do I word Here's this? the thing it's that not, all, it just sounds like they've already penciled them into Belleville and have not well, prepared and, to give and, them a chance. And I think, yeah. And I think what I was going to suggest or say there was that I know, I know if from a coaching standpoint, at the beginning of training camp, media people are always going to be asking you a million questions about certain prospects and DJ can't just commit to a guy and say, well, yeah, he's got a great opportunity here. I think, you know, we're going to try him off here at the start of the year. I think from a coach's perspective, 
He doesn't want to give up too much. He doesn't want to show his cards because, again, all these players need to earn these spots. And he doesn't want to float in, uh, you know, maybe maybe a quote comes out that is used out of context and Igor looks at that the next day in the paper, right? So I think he's just being very careful with his words. He doesn't want to give up too much. And he's basically saying there are some spots available, but all these players have to earn it. And it creates a lot of internal competition among a lot of these prospects, which is always a very good thing. Uh, by the way, the first exhibition game for the Ottawa Senators is this Sunday against the Winnipeg mm-hmm. Jets, September 26th. Uh, and probably Sokoloff is in the lineup. Uh, we just yeah. sat down and spoke with him on Tuesday because right now, you know, Matt, uh, as a hockey player, you are just trying to get through camp. So we're trying to get these interviews done uh, just yep. when they have their free time. And, and right now it's pretty busy. Uh, he, he was very entertaining. And one of the favorite parts, and maybe we should discuss it after again, as I keep trying to ruin the interview, is uh, he gets a delivery to the door. And maybe we'll just call this a <laughs> teaser. Uh, but the great thing about Igor Sokolov is, is the personality that we're finally allowed to start to see NHL players and pro athletes show a bit of personality that we've seen from, I guess, NH or yeah. NBA or NFL players. Like he is such a welcome, uh, relief, I guess, if you want to put it that way, among watching guys try to come out of their shell a bit. Yeah. And players like that are very. Uh, contagious in a good way in the locker room when it comes to chemistry, which I know people get sick of hearing, but um, I can't tell you how important it is when you're playing an 82 game season. It's an absolute grind. You need good fun guys to have in the locker room. And he's one of them. Now he's got to play well, he's got to earn that spot, but his attitude alone um, is definitely working in his favor. And I know that the organization I'm sure is very well aware of this. I mean, he's been plastered all over social media and he's a marketing dream for a team. So I think at this point, If he can just put, you know, two and two together in these preseason games and show that he belongs and that he's made drastic improvements, we're going to see a lot more of that fun personality come out of him here at the end of the uh, training camp. All right, coming up, we will discuss more with Igor, uh, about Igor Sokolov after the interview. The interview brought to you, of course, brought to you by Whitewater Beer, whitewaterbeer.ca. Matt, I don't know if you know this or not before we get there, is uh, Whitewater has introduced a new beer called Killaloo Sunrise. I don't know if this is in your wheelhouse or not, but it is uh, in partnership with Beaver Tails. Uh, so we all know Saw that. It. Right? Yep. So it's a spiced beer, uh, recreates the familiar flavors of cinnamon and sugar sprinkled atop warm dough. Is this it in your wheelhouse? It sounds incredible. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? And, and, and the timing, these they're geniuses, eh? Like the timing of it, weather's starting to cool down a little bit. So you get a little bit more of that winter feel out of that beaver tail flavor. I can't believe I'm talking like I'm getting thirsty and it's, it's morning right now. I'm still thinking of cracking a beer before my workout, but yeah, good for them. I'm going to try them out. Uh, I guess we're just gonna have to give them a call and have some delivered. Uh, Yeah. I always like it when the beer Santa shows up. All right. Uh, (laughs) Ahead on the Wally Mathout show powered by Barhaven Ford. We have Igor Sokolov. And then after that, we've got Chris Drieger, who of course had the phenomenal phenomenal run in uh, Florida ended up now as a member of the Seattle Kraken. Don't go anywhere. You're watching the Wally Mathot Show. All right, welcome back to the show. Welcome once again, our good friend Igor Sokolov into the show. Igor, uh, I got to say, you look fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, all good supplies. Good supplies by good people. (laughs) I feel like I should wear a hat too, but I don't want to mess my hair. You know, I got to keep my hair under control, so... You know, it's always better off having a hat on. You've got, so, you've got some nice locks there, and they curl a little bit. That's, oh that's my God. beautiful. They're crazy. Beautiful. Yeah. yeah. Good. How's hotel life? I didn't miss it because of last year. Two two months in here, didn't miss it. But it's not too bad as well. You know, some now this year they can uh, clean our rooms and stuff. They can, you know, come inside, change our sheets and stuff. So it's obviously better. It's a little bit of drainage. So it's uh, not as bad. So how is how would you assess your rookie camp? Uh, I thought I, you know, had a pretty solid one. I, you know, made a good statement with the, you know, this development camp and, uh, you know, going into the rookie camp. And then obviously, you know, the first game on Saturday, I mean, it's not the best game I played, but I thought it, you know, not play, not not able to play hockey for, uh, what, four months we haven't played. And the last game was in, in May. So, and that. Uh, Obviously, seeing fans and stands too kind of shook me a little bit because you know it's been a year and a half and stuff. And uh, yeah, I think I thought I just played a you know right right game right way, but you know I was missing my uh, you know offensive creativity and that kind of stuff. You know, I only had uh, 
once one or two scoring chances and uh so it wasn't you know i felt like i could do better on monday and uh yeah and yesterday i kind of went you know on the rampage and you know stepped up and kind of you know scored the goals and uh you know had just a great game in overall so those two goals what's it do for you mentally and you talked about being a rampage like you seemed a little cranky on that game in that game yeah like the first well, the first first like roughing call I got, I scored my scored a goal, and I was kind of you know just tried to spin off and go you know to see see my teammates kind of you know sell a little bit with them and uh, go to the bench. And uh, next thing I know, the guy coming from the left side trying to kill me. So like if I would have relaxed like for one second, like you know straight leg, and he would have you know it would have ended up bad. So I kind of you know for me it's kind of it's it's hard to get me get me cranky out there. Like it's hard to be, but when you cross the line, like. You know, I got to step up for myself. And obviously, you know, seeing uh, lots of younger guys in my bench, right? So I kind of had to, you know, make my presence there and, uh, you know, let them know that, you know, I'm there and I'm going to step up if it, if it needed. So I thought the guy just crossed the line, tried to, you know, hit me after I scored a goal. I, I mean, you know, it's a different situation when I'm with the puck and, you know, he's trying to get away from me. So, okay. yeah. And, and the second one, uh, Mark, well, Castlick was, you know, one against four in uh by the bench and they're like all they're trying to fight him or something so i had to get in there as well so yeah i thought it was kind of a you know weird game obviously crappy game and i guess it's some some guys try to prove themselves that way but you know i'm you know their score goals but i can you know step up for myself because i'm a big guy and step up for my teammates so yeah good for you igor i i, I saw some of the clips too i didn't get to watch the game but um i thought it looked really good you looked very engaged and I think that's a competitive level that I'm sure a lot of coaches and general managers want to see as well, right? So you're, it, it, it's very evident that you've taken that step. You look very confident. And I think the biggest thing, as you just said, is that you're stepping up for your teammates. And even if you're a skilled guy, people love that. And it looks like you're really passionate about the game. So was what was the difference between that, that and that second game? Did you have a, ch a chat with anybody on the coaching staff that kind of gave you some tips or you just kind of made that little switch on your own? Uh, yeah, I, I always even taken it from last year, you know, I always watch videos on my game every shift with Ben Sexton, the forward coach. So, you know, I basically text him right after game and he told me like, let's have a chat right now. Just talk about it and stuff. And then, mm -hmm. uh, and then he kind of said, yeah, I'm going to have a re video ready for you tomorrow. So we kind of talked about it, everything. And he said, like, I know what you feel like. I know what you think you should have scored, blah, blah, blah. You try to put pressure on yourself and. And you said, and he said, you obviously got to understand, like, you know, like you, you didn't play a game for a long time and, you know, it's all catching up and, you know, you, you got to get your feet wet again. Right. So, yeah. yeah. And he said, like, I know you and your mentality that I expect you to see you as a best player on the ice on Monday. And I know it's going to happen. And yeah, next day I kind of went in and uh, watched the video and, you know, it was, it was some good stuff to build up on from, uh, you know, mm. Saturday night because, you know, I took I took care of defensive game really well. Like I, I had no yeah. problems in the zone coverage and I was physical, you know, just was missing that a little bit of creativity. And, you know, other yeah. side of us, that was like uh, I was we were playing on, on the line and we like didn't really have a chance to build up that chemistry, too. So it was another thing. So, yeah. And yeah, I watched the video and kind of, you know saw that I have uh, lots of good things to build up on and, you know, and just, I guess they tried to put me and Pinto together for that game. And uh, I guess it worked out well. I kind of, you know, felt the guy and he felt me and uh, yeah, we, we built up pretty good chemistry. So, you know, it was, it was a really fun game to play with him. When's the last time you had to sit in the penalty box with your own goalie? <laughs> I honestly don't even know if we were doing that in midget. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm not sure what what was going on there, but that was kind of you know I was the most random thing. Like I walk in and Mendo is there twice. I'm like, all right, you gotta open a box for me at least. Like <laughs> I'm not gonna do it by myself. But I don't know. It was it was kind of it was a little bit random to me, honestly. Though I thought you know it's and it's we all under NHL right. It's a rookie game. Like you know yeah. at least for people who is opening up the boxes and stuff. Like it's you know it's a usual thing for any game. The funny part was Kevin Mandeliz is in the box and he waves to you as you're coming over and you like, you just wave back to him. I just, I chuckled at this every time I try and see this. Yeah. I was, I, he sent me the tweet, tweet to you right after the game. Basically I was like dying laughing on the, on the bus for like solid, like 20 minutes, probably just watching that. 
I thought it was just like, I know I'm one of those guys to, you know, I'm, obviously I'm dialed into the game, but I try to have as much fun as I can, right? And this was just yeah. like one of those things where it's pretty funny that, you know, he sits there and I come in and just, you know, have a chat with him. And then in two minutes, he's going to open up box for me. Like, it's it's kind of funny to think of it. So, yeah, I, yeah, I waved to him. I guess he missed me because I came back and, you know, he missed me for a little, for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and so those who don't know, Kevin and you were teammates in Cape Breton, so you know each other very well. Um, yeah, exactly. Speaking of skating and in Cape Breton and in Halifax this summer, I know you've been asked about Sidney Crosby and Nate McKinnon. What did you take away from them, I guess, the most as you skated with them? I think just the pace they're playing in the hockey, how, you know, how quick they're making those decisions when I, you know, had to go two on two, like with Nate against other opponents, like, and you just, you know, like kind of try to keep up with him and it makes things so much easier because, you know, he's always open, he's always there, and he kind of talks to you, and and same thing with Sid, 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 like, he's always talking, talking, and trying to, you know, help you, so I think that's, like, one of the things, like, communication, and obviously pace, and, you know, that they're always 100%, no matter what drill is that, no matter what they do, three on three, four on four, it's always 100%, they, you know, never step off the gas pedal. Was there any nerves when you took to the ice for the first time with those guys? Yeah, I was... You know, after after practice, I was kind of more, a little bit worried if I get invited back or not. So, <laughs> so I, I, I glad I I'm glad I did. So didn't get didn't get cut. So yeah, that was, and obviously just you know coming up to them and was like like hi, I'm Igor. Thank you for letting me out. And they're like, hey buddy, how are you? And it's just like, oh my god, like I might cry. <laughs> did you ask for a stick? Did you get any autographs? No. no. Okay. So was, the one thing, the one thing I've heard about Sydney in these skates is he's ultra competitive. And I think it was Drake Batherson who told me it's like, he is all in on everything. Like you don't want to lose if you're with Sydney Crosby. Oh, it's the same thing about all of them. Like uh, Brad Marchand and Nate and uh, Sid there when we play free on free and they usually Nate and Sid on opposite teams. And it just, you go at it and, you know, he, you got you got to be 100 percent. like if you're not like you're not invited back like if you don't try like yeah buddy like we can find somebody better like mm -hmm. we're here to mean business and it's just like yeah we're going 100 percent. if i'm going 100 percent and i spent 15 years in nhl as a top player and you're trying to make nhl you go you go 100 percent. yep uh speaking of drake batherson uh, has he bought you a dinner since he decided to sign a new deal that's going to pay him handsomely uh, he haven't actually. Still haven't. I'm still waiting on that invite. <laughs> I'm still waiting on that invite. I'm still waiting, <laughs> patiently waiting. Maybe you know main camp is starting now because I guess he might thought, thought I'm pretty busy with the rookie camp and the dev camp. But you know, when we get a day off or something, he might invite me. Up, you know, for a for a dinner or something. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> no one Drake. I don't know. I might have to text him and ask him if he can take me because I don't think he's gonna <laughs> offer me that. It's, I think it's this NHL thing. Meth is very tight with his wallet, too. Uh, it is nice to see him. You've got to obviously be happy for your good friend to get that new deal. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, it's just, it feels really, you know, really nice for him. And, you know, seeing him, like, in junior being his teammate and the billet brother and then just, you know, always keeping in touch with him. And he always texts me and, you know, getting a message from him after the game yesterday was, you know, something you always wanted to see, right? Like him texting me and telling me like, great job and stuff. And he was watching some of their practices and sending me messages and stuff. So like, yeah, I think it's, it's pretty nice to have him, you know, kind of, you know, him having me under his wing and kind of talk to me and, you know, help me adjust to pro hockey as quick as possible and stuff. So yeah, I'm happy for the guy. And honestly, like, you know, it's crazy to think like, two what three four years ago we were drinking ice caps and Tim Hortons and now he makes 4.9 or whatever his deal is so yeah I'm happy for him that's for sure that he changed his lifestyle you you and Drake are now the new Nate and Sydney at Tim Hortons drinking ice caps oh my god seriously though <laughs> uh I, who's stronger by the way Mark Castellic or you or sorry Castellic or you he is a unit so I'm not going to say anything about it. Not even a, he's just a unit. I saw the guy last year for the first time and I thought he's 29 by the way his lo body look. Yeah. I mean, I try, I'm trying to get up to him. Like I'm already, you know, I'm kind of found my way into my body and stuff, 
but like he is a unit. He's a strong boy. Uh, he got to wear the C, if I'm not mistaken, Monday, and you got to wear an A. Do the letters mean uh, as much to you guys when you're, you know, first trying to make an impression at rookie camp and whatnot? Like, I guess, what did it mean to get that letter on your jersey? Uh, I thought it was just like, even, you know, first game, we both didn't have a letter, but we kind of, you know, one of those guys who played pro games already and stuff. So uh, I thought it's just, you know, Maybe we still had to be a leader in the dressing room and, you know, having an A on my jersey didn't change anything. Like I was still trying to be a leader and stuff. So it didn't really change much. Uh, all right. Uh, coming up is fitness testing. How excited are you? Because I've never heard of one NHL player admit to enjoying fitness testing. I've done it already in development camp. So I'm done with it. I don't have to do it. You, oh, do you it guys tomorrow. are lucky. You're yeah, so I don't have lucky. to do anything else. I'm done. I'm done with yeah. testing. How'd it go guys. then? What? Yeah, yeah, I actually really impressed myself. Good. Yeah, Good. You, I put, actually, you put in a lot of work this summer, right? Yeah, I actually did, you know, did impress myself and, uh, you know, everybody else around, you know, kind of working from last year to this year. Igor, what were, what were some of the stuff they had you guys doing? Did you have to do any on ice stuff, like a skating test? Yeah, a skating test is a, just a regular mountain test. And, yeah, the mountain. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah, and then in, so the gym, much- in the gym, did you have to do any like, uh, Anything like explosive or anything difficult? Uh, it in there? was like a single leg broad jump, yeah. uh, vertical jump, then aerodyne half a mile as quick as you can. Oh, that one sucks. Yeah, bench, <laughs> bench, bench press with dumbbells. Yeah, yeah, and that's all easy. But the the wind yeah, bike, a, the air like, is really like, hard. It's what it's what you need for a hockey player, like you know what I mean, like yes. power and strength in your upper body. So I think it was pretty nice. You know, to Good. get it done with and you know don't have to worry and stress about it anymore yeah because tomorrow because you guys have medical so so it's just an easy medical day then for all the guys that were at rookie camp right you just go in i think i the... think we're literally i think we're literally done with everything because we've done all the medicals and all that oh stuff. you did all your we, medicals as well yeah we're oh, just okay. gonna have like meetings and stuff i would say and you know photo nice. shoot and stuff, whatever the headshots so yeah okay one second <laughs> <laughs> i was hoping this would happen Hello? Yeah. Uh, okay. Let's get a little water. What are we gonna do now? I'm gonna. <laughs> okay. Gotta hydrate. Are you? One second. I'm gonna come out. Are you gonna hold out for a second because the guy's just like has like ten cases of water right there and he doesn't know. Yeah, what yeah. To bring him in. We're, we'll we're in for all of this. Okay, sounds good. Just give me like two minutes. Okay. <laughs> we got a good view at least. You set I it feel up. Feel like That's there needs nice. to be a little bit of music. Do 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 do. Let's see here. I'm trying to let's see. We've had Ron Tugnut cooking a turkey that you had to check on. We yeah. had T Bone trying to do everything in his car. Uh, we lost FaceTime him for a and drive bit. through Brooklyn. Yeah. Yeah. There was somebody yeah. else that had to go and check something and then came back. And I can't now remember who it was. So this yeah. is not uncommon. No, it's oh, not. There was the Igor time and they had to turn the lights on. Yes. Yeah. It's starting <laughs> to get dark in his room. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> apparently uh, how much water did he say he ordered he said like 10 cases what's he oh like God, what are you going to do with all that water i mean i guess he's gonna he's gonna drink he's it i mean <laughs> yeah there it is <laughs> so this is yeah no it's a first very a this delivery. is a very very professional podcast i, I was just gonna say this is tell. serious business yeah yeah do we want to bring craig in for a I quick intermission here or? Craig, do you want to hop on for a sec and chime in? Hey guys, what's happening? Yeah, this is hilarious. I like that he uh, had the intuition to make sure his camera was uh, pointed that way, though. That was very smart of him. <laughs> now, I, what do you tip for a guy that brings up ten cases of water? It's like a shirt. Well, I can tell you right now that he is—he will be expecting something, and I'm, we're going to ask Igor when we finally get him back on. If he did it back, tip. I, I would give at least ten to twenty bucks. I'd probably give the guy twenty. For all wow. that water, at least, at least. I would yeah. just say my name is Drake Batherson, is what I would do. Yeah. <laughs> Throw Drake case, on the bus. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> oh sp- Look, what is it? What does he have in there? Are you okay? I think I see sparkling water too. It's not just flat. Well, we'll ask very European though. You right know, I'm, all, I'm all about it. I, I go through Murphy. like six or seven Perriers a day. Igor, what's what do you got back there? <laughs> do you really want to see it? Yeah, sure. show us. Let's take a look at this mountain. 
what are they? Is it just regular oh, uh, flat water? That's a flow. Yeah. Uh, the flow. Oh, flow. Oh, tell did you get a deal on that? I uh, just, uh, I, um, one second. Where I know the, I know the guy like yeah. part of it. Okay. So he nice. sends. Nice. Yeah, they're a Canadian. I think they're a Canadian company, aren't they? Yeah, it's pretty good actually. I love yeah. it. I, nice. Yeah. Nice. So before we got way sidetracked, I didn't mean to keep you this long, but one of the things, uh, no, 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 don't worry. Meth and I just talked about was uh, sparkling water that Europeans love drinking sparkling water, even on the bench. And I could never understand it. So can you explain it? I honestly talk about, I don't know how weird it is, but yesterday after a game, I was craving a sparkling water. It was nowhere found. <laughs> I can drink sparkling water all like, oh, yeah, really? I'm yeah, with you. I'm the same. That's all we drink in our house. But, Unless I'm working out or, or playing hockey, I'm drinking regular water mm -hmm. and sparkling all the time. Okay, but Always did you drink it while you played, though? I uh, know. No, I no. drink it while I'm playing. No. Yeah. No, my yeah. stomach gets like too full if I drink that. It's very acidic. Uh, yeah. Uh, spe speaking of which, how hungry do you get during practice? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we had a couple long days at the ring, so that was I know what you're what you're talking about. I, we had <laughs> we had a couple long days at the ring when we were uh, working out and practice, and then flood, and then power play practice, and then. You know, first thing I'm like, I'm gonna eat like at nine, and then next my next meal, few, big meal is gonna be like around two thirty. So, we're getting pretty hungry. <laughs> uh, and finally, before we let you go, uh, there is openings obviously at training camp, and I don't know how much you study a roster because it really that's not what affects your game. But do you go into camp knowing that there is a spot at least that there's an opening that you can, I guess, almost make if you can make an impact, you have a chance here. I think for me, it's just, you know, I wanted to come in with the right mindset and don't think about that stuff. Like, I just want to be myself there and, you know, obviously, you know, work, work hard every day, you know, give it a hundred percent and, uh, you know, show, show coaches that I'm, you know, I'm here for a reason and stuff. And, you know, when uh, preseason games come, you know, just show up there with the right mindset. Obviously, you know, yesterday game kind of helped me to build that confidence in the main camp. So. Yeah, for me, I just, you know, want to come in and work as, as hard as I can. And, uh, you know, it's not me who's making a decision. And, you know, I'm not going to be upset with, you know, going down to Belleville and have a great year there. And, you know, just yeah. kind of help to build up my confidence and get more, you know, could get more more ready for NHL. So, you know, see what happens. And obviously, I'm just looking forward to compete there and, you know, just being around the NHL guys and just learn from them. Hmm. Uh, what are your thoughts on number 75? Do I look like Ryan Reeves out there? <laughs> <laughs> it's a good number like that's that's a high number you know i had like a 48 at one point in training camp i had some bad numbers 75 is an nhl number i feel like so i think yeah. you're okay yeah i don't mind it actually yeah i didn't mind it like it's it's a pretty good number like i yeah. i it never had good. anything higher than 20 like 29 never but no, no I, don't, I don't mind it yeah mm. it's a pretty pretty solid number well, listen, we look forward to seeing number 75 eventually turn to probably number 13. So we'll be excited to hopefully see you opening night, but we look forward to any preseason games you're going to be in, my friend. Uh, all Thank the best. You. Stay hydrated. For sure. Thank you, guys. Take okay. care, Igor. See you, Igor. See yeah. And as always, our thank yous to Igor Sokolov. And hey, Matt, he's wearing the merch. I know I was I was genuinely shocked, and I thought maybe did you set that up with them or something? Because I'm I, I, so I when he arrived in Ottawa, I sent over a box of stuff for him. Oh, good, right on a little swag uh, bag. Okay, well, yeah. hopefully he'll be wearing that around the arena too, right? Well, that's what I'm hoping for. And if, but if if he's not, everybody out there can. If you go to GongShow.com, you can get the Wally Mathot merchandise there uh, under collaborations. Anyway, it, I mean he, he's been very good to us. I remember in Cape Breton, he's like, "Are you gonna send me some of those shirts?" So I. Yeah. I Anyway, I said, we'll take care of you when you get to Ottawa. So uh, nice. it was good to see. And he's getting taken care of by everybody. He got like 97 cases of water showing up at the door. Mm -hmm. He's lucky. And you know what? All that flow, like it looked good. I was at first, yeah. I'm thinking like, why are you ordering all this water? And then they pulled it into the room. And I'm thinking, well, my next question was, where are you going to put all of it? But <laughs> he's just trying to stay hydrated. And that just goes to show you how motivated this kid is. I see like a, a flow igloo 
in a, in his room that he's just <laughs> sitting in anyway. What a guy though. I don't think I've ever really, and I, I don't say this lightly. I've never yeah. seen that before. Maybe you have like six bottles on the go at a time and guys will leave the arena every day with a, like a bag full of them. Yeah. But to have like 10 cases delivered is just, it's special. We'll, we'll leave you guys, it at that. You guys in your Fiji water. I think I always used to see like players <laughs> Fiji? in Fiji water. No, maybe, maybe like some, some 13 year veteran, but are you kidding? A guy like Igor, <laughs> or even when I first got in league, I could, I couldn't afford Fiji. I was drinking Dasani or anything free that I can get my hands on uh, at the arena. That's so, I always laughed at Fiji. I was like, why is this $4 a bottle at Starbucks? But I, anyway, yeah. Um, all right. Thanks to Igor Sokolov coming up. We've got uh, Chris Drieger now. As always, uh, this is one of the favorite parts of our show is the Pearls of Wisdom. Of course, brought to you by SportsInteraction.com, SportsInteraction.com slash Wally Mathot. Just head over there now. Start to set up your account. It's going to take a little bit of time as it does for all online gaming sites. However, uh, check out their website, their interface, and look into it. They've got some great stuff for you to look around and make some bets on. They're lots of fun bets. So it even allowed us to bet on our golf tournament that we had uh, with Simmer and Mendez. So uh, SportsInteraction.com slash Wally Mathot. Check them out today. They are Canada's odds makers. All right. Here we go. Pearls of wisdom. Uh, his goals against average and his save percentage over the last two seasons, Matt, best in the entire National Hockey League. 37 Ooh. goalies in NHL history have recorded a shutout in their first career start. Of course, Drieger being number 37. Two goalies to record a shutout in their first career start seven plus years after being drafted. Chris Drieger and Jordan Bennington in St. Louis. Anyway, um, nice. Th- like he's, he's just done some great stuff since he's left Ottawa and it looked like, you know, his career was going to be over. And all of a sudden he's now like a darling, if you will. Like he just he came in. It's the thing of don't give up on yourself and keep believing. Right. Mm. And eventually you may get that shot. Yeah. Uh, as we go into our pre-scout course brought to you by BEI Bonisher Excavating Inc. He's a 27 year old Winnipeg, Manitoba native drafted third round 76th overall by Ottawa back in 2012. Now, as we just said, it took Drigger more than seven years from being drafted to make his first start in the National Hockey League, and he did end up with another team. That was the Florida Panthers, November 30th, 2019. Uh, signed as a free agent by Florida in 2019 and then claimed in the expansion draft in July 21st, 2020. Chris Drieger is our main guest today as we have a chat with him in the Whitewater chat. And, and Drieger, like, and before we begin, Matthew, one of the things I liked about him, very honest and open, and he was, yeah. you know, you could tell when he got emotional talking about in making his first NHL start. I, I just enjoyed our conversation with him. Yeah, I agree. And I, I love, I li- and you, you nailed it there. I don't want to repeat everything you just said, but just some of the stories where he kind of just started to figure things up. He's cha- he, excuse me, figured things out. His attitude started to change a little bit. And all of a sudden the progression that he saw in his game and, and, and he was able to really make that next step again and jump. And that's, that's like what we were talking about earlier with a lot of these young players in training camp. It's just figuring things out getting that confidence and applying it in games and it's opportunity, right? It's, it's being able to play a good game at that right time when one of your general managers happens to be there and then you get the jump, you get called up and he ran with it. And that was Drieger's story. And it's pretty admirable. And I think a lot of people hopefully can gain some of that from watching it. Well, you wonder how many people would have given up on their dream if it had taken them over seven years, right? Like I, even for anything out there, I just can't imagine trying to hang on and keep thinking, you know what, I can still do this. So I'm, Full credit to him. Good for him. Good for him. Uh, all right, here we go. Chris Drieger now in the Whitewater chat, uh, talking about all things, including how he began his career with the Ottawa Senators. All right, welcome back to the show. Now joining us in the Whitewater chat is Chris Drieger, who was drafted by the Ottawa Senators, but really rose to fame playing with the Florida Panthers. Is now a new member of the Seattle Kraken, the NHL's 32nd franchise. Uh, Driggs, as we've always come to know you, welcome to the show, my friend. Hey, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks for having me. Now, let's get this out of the way right now. And I know the two of you know each other, but your last name gives announcers and everybody fits. <laughs> and I'm sure, like, how many different variations have you heard of your last name? Yeah, probably about a dozen. But uh, <laughs> my, my all-time favorite was the Rick Walmsley. He'd say, Dredge! And he did his, like, high-pitched voice. and <laughs> So that was one of my all-time favorites. He, he, and, like... You know, I, I was with Wammer for probably five years, and I don't yeah. think he ever made the effort to, to figure no. it out, but it <laughs> just made surprised. it like, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> no, it's, it is definitely a bit of a nightmare. Everyone always asks me, and I'm like, yeah, there's, I don't know, there's a silent D in there. I did make the rules, but uh, I can see how it could get, it could get confusing for you guys. It's so good. So, did anybody else 
go with that or did just only Walmart was the only one that stuck? Like I can see teammates I just think, wanting to jump on that. Yeah, no, it was actually just Walmart. I think in my entire <laughs> career, that's called me dredge, but uh, <laughs> you know what? It, <laughs> it was pretty funny and everyone like, I, I think nowadays everyone's pretty much on dregs, but it was dredge for a while. Dreger, dryger, you know, dryger, whatever yeah. you name it. I've heard it. So, but I, I mean, at this point it's, it's whatever you, you just go with the flow. Yeah. But they got it right when you were announced in uh, Seattle. And I want to know what it was like to be a member of the Seattle Kraken's expansion team. Yeah. Pretty exciting. I mean, um, never really seen anything like that going, they flew me in for the draft and they kind of had like this whole park, uh, I, I guess, blocked off for the, for the event. So I don't know what the final numbers are, were for people there, but it was packed. There was boats in the oh, lake. Yeah. Like yeah. there was a boat with a massive crack and not like blow up octopus on the top of it. And I was like, this is, <laughs> I guess these people are pretty excited. So it was a cool experience and like just getting here and then getting to see the city. It's, I mean, it's an incredible city. I think they're, they're doing a great job here and I'm excited to get going. And Driggs, what was the city like? I mean, I've never been to Seattle. And I think most NHL players would have no idea, other, you know, unless they live out in that area. What was it like? It's a great city. I mean, people kind of sleep on Seattle. They're like, ah, oh, it's rainy. Like, it hasn't rained once since I've been here. So that's a positive. Uh, it's got a huge downtown, tons of restaurants. Yeah. Um, you got mountains on both sides of you. So it's it's almost kind of a little bit like a like a Denver vibe where you're like close to the mountains or even Calgary um but then it's just like really green and lush and it's just good good vibes out here man nice so you're downtown now you've already got a place yeah i'm just in the hotel i don't get possession for another week of my place uh, but uh yeah i just rented a condo kind of just outside downtown was was the market just stupid like expensive or how is that in comparison to most <laughs> yeah. places <laughs> it's pretty pricey yeah. i think the tech here the, yeah there's a lot of tech here and that the, just been driving prices up uh, and enough. I mean, real estate's kind of crazy everywhere right now, but like some of the guys with longer term deals were looking to buy and they're looking at the market, like, holy smokes, I didn't realize I was going to have to drop this much money on the place. So we'll see how it plays out over the next yeah. few months here. That's fascinating. Okay. Take, I, I, we've got so much to cover, but I gotta, take me to the expansion draft day when you're seeing Frank Saravalli give out the entire list before the, uh, announcement. Gets made. <laughs> oh Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that was a tough one i know that the crack and staff was not happy about that because i know i got in and they gave me like like full undercover like my room was under a different name and i'm like are you sure this is for me it says like carson douglas and they're like well you see like cd and I'm like, oh, oh. <laughs> i guess we're going serious undercover here uh but yeah so they, they did it well and like i had you know, someone at the hotel, like personally, like if I had any questions so that I wouldn't have to talk to like the regular people so that they can keep no it way. all hush hush. Yeah. <laughs> they, so they did it right. They did a really good job. And then, yeah, that morning you just see every single name on the list get leaked. And it's just like, well, wow, that's too bad because they really set up a great, yeah. um, you know, they, they did a great job like yeah. announcing everyone and they, they had some cool people um, announce the names. Uh, like Macklemore was announcing names, um, a couple other guys. Yeah. So there's some cool stuff like that. And, and there's tons of people that came out for it. And it sounded like they got a pretty good audience on TV too. So uh, it was, you know what, regardless of that, it was, it was a great time and like an experience I'll never forget. That's awesome. So who's, who's, was there any like, like murmurings with regards to who would have been responsible for releasing this? Like, were they the agents? I'm assuming if it was someone in the organization, you wouldn't throw him under the bus. I understand that. Right. But was there any rumors of who was talking all this stuff? Well, I mean, I don't really know much about that. All I know is like, I think once they, cause they needed to submit it to the league. And then I think like in the morning of that day. And then I heard once it got submitted, uh, then I, so I don't know. I don't know who yeah, did that, that but it Fair sat enough. around for so many hours. It was just exactly it's almost yeah, yeah. impossible. And yeah, so, and I'm not yeah. trying to, no, I'm not Matt trying to, trying like to investigate this right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Matt yeah, wants I'm not answers. Sure, but- yeah people were upset about it though like the whole crack sure. app was was choked yeah uh why did you pick 60 as a number uh it's a great question um well 33 just didn't quite work for me <laughs> career-wise <laughs> uh my career was on a downhill trajectory so i figured i needed to shake things up a little bit um i just always wanted like kind of a different number 
Uh, the only guy that comes to mind with 60 is Jose Theodore, which yeah. I liked. I, I remember watching him make some pretty crazy behind the back walker saves in the playoffs way back when I was a youngster. Um, and then no one else had really had it. So I said, you know what, let's take this and roll with it. Um, I always thought like goalie numbers kind of like, you know, were the multiples of 10 that, that kind of makes sense, uh, to me. So I was like 60 sounds good. Let's do it. And then I just kind of went with it and been 60 ever since. Interesting. So have you had a lot of buddies or family, everybody trying to get either gear or tickets to upcoming games? Like, are you being inundated now? <laughs> well, it's tough because like my family all wants to come to the home opener, but it's like the first game in crack in history. So like, I don't know how many tickets they're going to be able to get. Mm. So I kind of, I reached out like a month ago and was like, Hey, like, what can we do for tickets here? Like, can I yeah. <laughs> maybe reserve a couple extra ones or whatever? <laughs> so so I think there's going to be some unhappy family members, but I think, you know, my mom and dad and brother are going to be there. And I think my grandma, if we can swing that, that last nice. ticket. So yeah. Uh, yeah. So that one's the big one, the whole opener. And it gets sure. challenging, right? Like I, I experienced that here in Ottawa where if you're on the hook all the time and you're always paying, cause for, for a lot of fans out there that don't understand this, you only get two tickets per game. Right. So it's yeah. like, are you on the hook then for all your other family members that are coming in drinks or what? Yeah. I mean, I sort of like, I had this conversation with my mom the other day and I was like, Hey, it, like if my grandma's going to come watch me play, like she's never yes. going to have to pay for a ticket <laughs> ever. And then there's a few <laughs> other people on that list, like aunts and uncles, but it is tough. Like depending how many games they come to and stuff, I kind of said like, Hey, you know what? The first one is on me and probably the next few after that. But like, yeah. if, you know, I got aunts and uncles up in Vancouver. If they're coming out down to like 20 games a season, then maybe, Maybe we reevaluate. That's where you draw the line. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> they know that's that you don't get the ten point five all at one time, right? Yeah, yeah. I, don't, I think they know, but I'll have to clarify. <laughs> uh, speaking of that contract, when I think back of how far, like nine years ago, I think you were drafted, if not somewhere around there. Um, like, what's that feeling like to put pen to paper to a three-year deal, one way, the ten point five million dollars for a guy that. I, like you had an auspicious start to the obviously your NHL career when you five years and you had played three games for the Ottawa Senators. Yeah, it was a pretty emotional moment. I mean, I remember talking to my dad on the phone and just kind of, you know, breaking down a little bit. But it's it's just one of those times where it's just such a thankful like grateful day. Um, and I remember I made a bunch of calls to like former goalie coaches and stuff like that. But it was just kind of like, um, sorry, I'm getting kind of emotional just talking about it, but it's, um, just one of those days where you just have to thank the people that got you there because yeah. like, you don't do that without them, you know, like it's, it's those people and, you know, my parents and my, you know, my dad going out there on the ice when I was eight years old and, and taking notes in the stands at goalie camps and stuff like that. So he could teach me better for the next couple of years and stuff like that. So <laughs> it's just like those little things that you just have to go out and say, thank you. And, and uh, it was a pretty special day. It made a lot of phone calls to people I hadn't talked to in a while. Um, you know, and it was, it was, it was a really, really incredible experience. Yeah. I, like I can't imagine. And Matthew, you know, obviously you got to the NHL and you had your dad there, there with you. Like what was, I guess your dad like Driggs was he, I, I've seen some crazy goalie parents. In fact, I think they're all <laughs> crazy. And like, was he fairly normal? So my dad, so I've got two sides of the spectrum here. My mom is maybe a little closer to the crazy side. And <laughs> my dad is like the most mellow, nonchalant guy like ever. So he was always, you know, very, very relaxed and, and never worried. And, and he was coaching me. I think he coached me for either two or three years when I was like eight, nine and 10, something like that, or maybe nine, 10, 11 when I was young. So he was good. He was always level-headed and just kind of, you know, go with the flow and, there was my mom making sure that I was never getting the short end of the stick and making sure that I was getting into all the, all the summer hockey teams that I wanted to and all that stuff. So I, I had a bit of both, but I was lucky. They never really, you know, imposed their will on me. They kind of let me do whatever I wanted to do and just kind of advocated for me when, whenever they could. So good. Cause I, I remember in, it's been recent where goalie parents will stand on the goal line and then the period will end. They'll go to the other end and stand on the goal line and they got hand signals and the kid will always look this way and nod at the bench. I'm like, this is out of control. Yeah, that's too yeah much. That, might be a, that might be a bit much. I never had to deal yeah. with that, thankfully. That's good. Uh, so good. All right. Um, let's go back and start at Ottawa as we go through your career because it's 
I just think it's a fantastic story of how you persevered through all this. So uh, you're drafted by Ottawa. You play in, I'm, I think it's five seasons. You make three appearances. You don't start in any of those games. I think it totals 95 minutes. At, at any point, did you go like, what am I doing here? <laughs> yeah, I mean, so it was tough. I mean, I was kind of on the trajectory to be maybe one of the guys at that at one point or to be in the NHL at one point. And that was kind of my, I want to say my third year pro. Um and then, uh, you know, my fourth year happened and it just kind of went downhill. We got a couple extra guys, um, you know, the coach in the American league just decided he didn't want to play me very much. I think I started that year hurt. And then, uh, at one point we had like four goalies in the American league. So it was just a bit of a, um, bit of a mess, uh, for me. And, and I was hurt and kind of older at that point and they kind of wrote me off and, and that was that. So I was, I was definitely that year was, a, was a frustrating year. Um, I was in Belleville as like the number three to four goalie, depending on the week <laughs> and uh, playing kind of every two to three weeks, if I was lucky. Um, and then not to mention that, but we were terrible. So we were getting thumped every time I'd go in and it'd be like, all right, 50 shots against. <laughs> like, <geez. laughs> so uh, I don't think my stats look very good that, uh, that year either. So that was definitely some dark days. And, and then after that, you just kind of look in the mirror and, and I got a new opportunity with Florida's organization. And uh, I just kind of decided that I wanted to reinvent who I, who I was and, uh, and just kind of, you know, be a new Chris Drieger. So, um, you know, whatever reasons that they didn't, um, you know, continue their faith in me in Ottawa, I wanted to make sure that there was no, no reason, like those reasons were in this buried in the sand and, and no more. So no one had that excuse. You know, you can't give the guys, uh, you know, management an excuse to not play you, especially when right. you're coming in to a new organization where you have zero standing. No one there drafted you. You've yeah. got no one in your corner. It's just you got to play. You're like, that was the only guy in my corner. Right. So that was kind of my mindset and uh, got some lucky breaks on the way. And here we are. <laughs> But being the reporter in me, I'll continue to go back to Ottawa for a second. Um, is the your your last game in, uh, as a member of the Ottawa Senators is in Calgary. Uh, it's Craig Anderson has just left to be with his wife, Nicole, who just got diagnosed with cancer. And Hammond starts that game, gets hurt, and then you get in and yeah. uh, right, and then allow I think you allow four goals and it's a five two loss. Did, did you it was not my night that night. No, but uh, it wasn't it was anybody's no, night, In right? fairness to Driggs, it was nobody's night. Like, that's yeah, a like, tough building to play in. You, ha you have terrible defensemen in front of you. <laughs> yes, that night you did. <laughs> no, that was like, a tough night for me. I remember that. Uh, I remember that pretty vividly. I remember, you know, when you go into a situation like that, I remember at one point, Mark Crawford looks at me on the bench when Hammond's in. He goes, hey, this guy's on a short leash. Make sure you're ready. And I was like, geez. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. so I'm like sweating on the bench. Like, oh, my God. You know, hopefully yeah. I'm all right. And then uh, I remember a couple things from that day. And then uh, they go in. I, yeah, I think Hammond, Hammy Lennon won. I think we're up 2-1 after the first. And uh, I go in the room and Hammy's like, yeah, Broin gone so i'm like geez so then dion Phaneuf walks over to me and he just looks at me and he goes confidence <laughs> and walks away i'm like i don't know how i don't know if that instilled any confidence what a guy eh? like he's and he's so full of shit sometimes too i see i don't even remember that part anyway i'm gonna have to text him after this yeah I, so she good. looked at me and there's like pretty intimidating like i'm young oh, yeah. and, you know, this is fucking sure. dion. sorry pardon my french this is dion Phaneuf. <laughs> Um, yeah. and he, uh, yeah, just confidence. That was it. No, like explanation, nothing. So, so I, uh, so I, I went in and I was like, all right, well, maybe I should try and get ready for this. I, you know, do a little juggling, whatever. And our goalie coach comes in and talks to me and, you know, wasn't all that inspiring either. <laughs> and, then, uh, and then I kind of go in and the first shot goes in, I think it was like, a. It was, I think it was going wide and then the guy batted it down and passed it right back door. So I was sliding right. He passed it mm. left, tap in wide open. That first one goes in. I'm like, oh, geez. And then I was just kind of fighting it ever since. So it was a tough game, but it was just one of those ones where you learn, you know, like you, you just have to be ready. You know, I probably could have done a better job preparing for that one. It was the first one I, since I've been called up. So I think they traded for Con in the next day and that's an opportunity missed. So 
it was a good learning experience for me. I just, you know, you only get a certain amount of opportunities. You know, if I go in and play well, then maybe they stick with me for a little bit. Maybe I make the NHL a little bit sooner. I, it, you know, you can play what ifs all day, but exactly. what you can't do is, is blow those opportunities, which I did in that, in that instance. So it was good that I, that I was lucky to get a second chance and, hmm. and, uh, but always learn from, from that, uh, that day. Did Dion Phaneuf ever say anything to you after? <laughs> he was pretty quiet after the game. After I let four, he didn't say much. <laughs> I, I, and I'm not trying to make light of it because I know it's tough when you're getting called up and you want to be obviously the guy and you want to make a statement. So, uh, but I do know like watching you around the room in those times that you were up, you were and you weren't just up for a little bit. Like you had a month or two a stretch there that you were around the room. And I've, there's just a quiet air of confidence about you uh, that I knew that, you know, if it wasn't going to be in Ottawa, it would probably be somewhere. But you, when Ottawa didn't sign you, you went back and played like you signed with Florida, but it was basically an AHL kind of deal. You ended up playing in the ECHL that year too. Like, are you thinking at some point I'm going to get another shot? Or are you just trying to play professional hockey? Is that a fair question? Uh, yeah, no, that's a very fair question. At that point, I was like, I knew I could play in the American League. Like I'd had success in the American League. So I was kind of upset like that all I got was kind of the fifth job. Um, but I guess I didn't really play much the year before. So it was kind of a coming off a tough year. Um, and my agent was kind of like, Hey, listen, in the situation in Florida, we got Luongo. I think he was 38 or 39 at the time. He, you know, was prone to injury. They had Reimer who was also fairly prone yep. to injury. Um, and I think they had Hutchinson and Montembeau was the four in front of me. So he said, hey, you know what? Like, this is your chance to get back in the American League. I, you know, I kind of like the, your odds once you get here. But so that was for me the first the first goal. I was like, all right, I need to go and get a fair shot in the American League. You know, get some games in and, you know, where there's two goalies. <laughs> there's not four goalies and we can make this work. And so, yeah, I went to the coast and I had sworn that I was never going back to the coast. And next thing you know, I'm in the coast. <laughs> so uh, that was a grind. But. I think it was good for me. Like I, I went in there and I said, like, I'm going to act as if I'm in the American league and I'm going to, you know, be a professional. And, and, mm. you know, it was one of those situations where it was my fifth year pro. A lot of guys in the coast are kind of out of college, younger guys. There's not too many guys that are there for five years. So a little bit, one of, one of the more experienced guys in the room and kind of had a bit more of a, and tried to portray that to the guys. Um, so it was good for me. And then, and then by the time, uh, sure enough, like, so I did the three training camps, NHL camp, AHL camp, ECHL camp. <laughs> sure enough, like day two in the coast of like the regular season, Lou goes down for like a month and I'm up in the American League and I play a few games. Uh, they go pretty well. Um, and then he gets healthy and I'm down. And fun fact about that year, I, I packed and unpacked everything I owned like 11 times or something oh ridiculous God. like that. Cause I was, I, I was I, Florida, a uh, springy match. And then I went up and down like six times, I think between that. And then I moved one, and then they gave me a housing letter in Springfield. So then I moved mm. to a different place, but it was, it was pretty wild. I was getting sick of it at that point. But by the end of the season, I had earned myself I woke, uh, uh, a job in the American league. They'd resigned um, me to a, to an NHL contract. And then um, Hutchinson had been traded away. So I was kind of the number four guy. Then they called Montembeau up. So all of a sudden I was starting in the American league, played the last like 22 games or like 20 of 22 games or something like that. And played, played the best I've ever played and ended up leading the league in save percentage at the end of the year. And it was like, mm. just one of those moments where you're like, wow, like, thank God I got this opportunity and um, things kind of paid off. And then as soon as the season ended they re-signed me to a two-year two-way deal um and then I was like kind of like all right I'm back like I'm back in the mix you know there was kind of an open backup job in Florida um they kind of had Sam Montembeau um slotted into that position he's their guy um I thought I'd you know played played pretty well and maybe I'll played Monty the year before in the American League so I knew that job could be potentially up for grabs. And that next year going in, I started the American league kind of, as I expected, my goal is to make the team out of camp. Monty had a great camp. I think he had a shutout in one of the preseason games and, you know, he earned the job and then uh, his performance faltered a little bit, at, you know, a month and a half in 
Um, they ended up switching us. They called me up. I uh, got my first start. Okay, wait, you can't talk about the first start. <laughs> yeah. That's a whole Sorry, other guys. story. I was going to chime <laughs> in on that, but I didn't. I kept my mouth shut. <laughs> Um, okay. Anyways, I'll let you guys take over from here. No, no. And to, to your interview, I should shut up. People are going like, Brent, stop talking. <laughs> the, um, but I, like, was there a coach that believed in you or if, that you felt uh, in all that time you were moving around? Or I guess in the off season when you knew that you had a shot, was there a different change in the way that you prepared? Um, so definitely there was a way, there was a change in the way I prepared. I mean, so I guess I'll, I'll get to that first and I'll, I'll touch on who the guys that were that helped me on the way. But um, so first off, yeah, like I have always been, I would say, uh, let me, let me word this properly. I'm, I have always been a smart worker and not necessarily the hardest of workers. <laughs> if you were, if you were to compare me to any other guy in the NHL, not to say I don't work hard, but like, I'm not going to waste my time doing stuff that doesn't benefit me. Whereas a lot of guys will just be like, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to do this, 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 this. And like that works for them. And that's great. So mm -hmm. I, so when, when things aren't good and you're a little too confident, that mindset can get pretty, it can, it, it can be detrimental to your success. Sure. Uh, I can see Walmer not liking that idea. Walmer was not a huge fan of no, that mindset. I can see that. So I basically at that point was like, okay, like whatever I'm doing didn't work. I need to switch it up. Like, let's, you know, I need to be a leader on what I do off the ice as well as on the ice. So I decided like, okay, I'm going to be the first guy to the rink and I'm going to be, you know, one of the last guys to leave. I'm going to make sure that I do the stuff that I need to do. Um, and then I sort of just developed a better routine for every single day I'd come in and I'd make sure I'd be in the gym um, not necessarily like throwing a ton of weight around, but just doing more like flexibility, mobility stuff, stuff that affects me, like stuff that is going to help me. So, um, I just started doing that and I just made sure I did that every single day. I'd get on the ice, I'd do a little routine before practice every day and just kind of made sure my habits were there so that I was getting better every single day. And whereas before I would have been maybe a little bit more prone to, ah, you know what? Like, I don't need to be early for this. So I'll just take it off. No big deal. Optional skate. I'll take the option. But I was like, <laughs> no, no optional skates, yeah. you know, make sure you get your time before, make sure you get your time after be early. I remember my first year I showed up in Binghamton and uh, you had to be there at like nine or whatever. The meeting was at nine and I was showing up at like, 8 40 thinking I was like, well, 20 minutes early. <laughs> you know, I got all the time in the world. And I couldn't figure out why everyone was already there once I got there. I was like, what are these guys doing? Are these guys crazy. And then uh you just kind of learn that like you need to get there early and get your stuff done. Like, you know, now if I was there 20 minutes early, I'd be panicking because you know, there's so many things that you have to get done before you get there. You go there, eat breakfast, roll out, yeah. stretch, go through your routine. Um you know, if you need to get work done on the training table, like you, you it just takes so much longer than 20 minutes. <laughs> so Great. yeah, that was, that was a change in my mindset for sure. And, and I think that helped, helped me a lot. And then uh, the second part of your question was who, who are guys in my corner? I don't know, Matthew, you ever ran into Corey Cooper? He was a, he was the American league goalie coach. Oh. You probably, you probably might've missed him. I'm, uh, yeah. But, or I'd, I'd probably <laughs> know him if I saw him, but the name doesn't really ring a bell right now. Yeah. Yeah. So he was the goalie coach in, in Binghamton with me. Uh, he was also there my last year in bingo. And then my mm -hmm. first, and then the year in Belleville. Um, so he was like incredible for me. He was always in my corner, like always believed in me while, even while I was in Belleville, you know, getting shelled for five a night playing every, every third week or whatever. So he was a great guy to talk to. And then, and then another one, which was kind of, you don't see as much as my agent was like super positive with me. Mm. Um, he kind of uh, was always on the phone, you know, a lot of agents that, you know, from what I've hear, from what I hear can just kind of, you know, if you're going through a tough stretch, all of a sudden you don't hear from the guy for six months <laughs> or whatever. So my agent was the opposite. You know, I was talking to him on the phone all the time and, and uh, he'd call and just make sure I was doing all right. Um, and then he kind of guided me to take the, the American league job in Springfield, even though I was like, maybe I should go to Europe. Like this job, this, this contract's kind of not really what I was looking for. Um, but he was like, you know what? I think this is your best bet. And 
his guidance got me to where I am. So I've, I've got to give him a huge shout out for that. So, um, guys like that. And, and I get to, once I get to Springfield, I had, uh, uh, Roberto's brother, um, Leo Luongo and, uh, him and I kind of got on the same page early and, and I told him, you know, these were the things that didn't work for me in Ottawa. Like stay on top of me. If I get lazy in practice, I want, I want you to tell me, um, and we kind of opened that communication early and, and he was fantastic for me. So I always shout out to, to all three of those guys. They did a great job. And that's just, you know, the tip of the iceberg. And Driggs, I got to hand it to you because the first part where you're talking about how you made that conscious change with your approach, going to the rank where you had to learn like, okay, I got to change things up here because this isn't currently working for me. I have so much respect for that because I think, a lot of kids, and I'm sure I'm going to get Craig to cut that clip because a lot of kids out there, junior players, college kids, that's a learning experience that you can't really, you can't really teach. You got to go through it yourself. But to hear somebody like yourself go through all that, go through the ringer for you know six, seven straight years, and all of a sudden you're finally getting some success because of the changes you've made, that's huge. And and I'm surprised because that was something that you said you did on your own, right? Like you didn't really have anybody have to kick you in the ass and say, okay, you got to change your ways. No one was holding your hand. You had to do that all, all on your own. Am I correct? Yeah. I mean, I just kind of was like, I took a look at my life and I said, do you want to be, you know, an ECHL American league goalie, maybe go to Europe and, yeah. you know, bum around over there for a little bit, which is, you know, totally respectable, but I just thought I was capable of more and I wasn't yeah. achieving what I wanted to. So, I mean, at that point you can either blame other people or you can look sure. in the mirror and, and figure out what the real issue was. And the issue was, was me and my approach. So yeah. um, it was definitely tough to accept that. That's a bit of a tough pill to swallow, but yeah. um, you can always make changes, right? And then, well, and, then uh, and, get another crack at it. Yeah, for sure. And that's that's another thing, right? It's like, I think that's the difference. That's what separates the elite guys, the, the regulars, players like yourself who sign these longer term deals and remain in the NHL versus the guys in the American League where you know, Driggs, a lot of guys can play at this level. They can play at the NHL level. They don't just maybe have all the same good, solid pro habits that an NHL player would have, right? So if there's sure. any young players watching this, those are the things you have to do to make that next step and separate yourself from all the other hundreds of thousands of other players below you. I just wanted to add that because I just love that little part of this, this interview because it's so positive and it's a, you're a perfect success story when it comes down to that. So I'll, I'll leave it to Wally now. You don't have to go anywhere, Matt. It's okay. Um, but let's get, say, so now is the big night. It's your first NHL start. So take me through all of it. Uh, because I know in Ottawa, we were watching like, and when we saw the final result, we're like, wow, like finally got his first start. The end result is a shutout for people that don't know. So amazing. Yep. Anton Strahlman has two goals. He's done only four time in his career. Um, <laughs> can, can you just, when did you find out, like, what was your mood mindset going into this? Uh, just give me the details. Yeah. So, um, yeah, this is one of the most exciting days of my, you know, my life up until this point for sure. Um, so I had gotten called up, I believe it was like, I think the game was November 26th, I think. November 30th. That, oh, so I got called up on the 26th then. So I got called up on the 26th. And, uh, you know, we have a, I, I think we play the next day in Washington. Um, and then we beat Washington or maybe we play that day. And, uh, or maybe we, I think we lost to Washington anyways. Um, <clears throat> so then we go back and we practice and, and Rob Tallis, my goalie coach skates over, um, before practice. And he just kind of like looking at me and I'm like, oh, fuck, am I good? Sorry. Sorry. I'm sorry. To <laughs> no, it's all good. No, no, it's fine. I'm like, it's fine. Uh, I'm like, oh, geez, am I getting, am I getting sent down already? And uh, he looks at me and he goes, you're starting, I forget what day of the week it was, but he says, you're starting the next game. And uh, I was like, let's go. And uh, so then he just kind of got it out of the way. You know, it was like four days, three or four days after I got there, I'd been having success in the American league. I'd been having, um, cause I had a great year the year before and I'd started the year even better this, this, this year. Um, and you know, I was playing with confidence. I played, I was playing the best hockey I'd, I'd ever played. So for them to put me in there was like, okay, these guys have been paying attention. Um, you know, they're going to give me a shot here, which is, which was incredible. Like just to have that confidence, 
Um, you know, I've been in situations where you get called up and you just never play and it kind of gets in your head a little bit, you know, you just, Oh, like, obviously they don't trust me. Like that mm -hmm. stuff's just, it's a, it's kind of a toxic mindset to have. Yeah. So it, when they, when they throw you in there right away and they say, Hey, let's see what you can do. It just gives you, it's, it's almost freeing, you know, you're able to just go in there and play. And, uh, that being said, like, you know, that's the no most nervous I've ever been in my entire life. <laughs> like I would go through <laughs> phases where I was, where I was like, so excited and and you know just looking forward to it and then i just be like it's been five years like maybe i'm not ready for this kind of thing and then you go back and forth with the voice in your head and i remember i was just sweating in my suit on the way to the rink and then i get there and i go through my routine and i start feeling a little bit better um that was another thing that i that i uh switched around is my pregame routine i just kind of made sure i was like i gotta make sure that this thing's gonna get me to the to play the best every single night consistency was something that I struggled with. I think my routine can help that. So I, um, did my routine, which, which was definitely better than the last time I got in the net in the NHL. So that helps, um, helped a lot. And as soon as I made the first save, I was just having a blast in there, man. Like you're not nervous at all. You just play. And all of a sudden I looked up and it was like six minutes left in the third period. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like it's, we and I remember we scored a couple. It was one nothing for the I think the first two periods, and I think we scored two goals, kind of late in the third. Oh, so I knew I was I knew I was getting the win, and uh, and yeah, and then so we played a, an incredibly solid defensive game, which was perfect for <laughs> for me. I think I had to make maybe one save that was like a, a pretty tough save, but other than that, it was just kind of I just needed to play solid and and uh, ended up going my way. So. I just remember looking up at the at the end of uh, the game when the buzzer goes, and I see Weegs right there. And I just put my hands on my head, and I was like, "There's no way that that just happened." You know, it's just it was a pretty <laughs> crazy moment. So, and I was able to fly in. I think we had like 14 or 15 people there, like family, friends. I had some buddies that were playing the SPHL in like Tennessee or something. They flew in. They they just like asked their coach for the day off, and then because <laughs> I was starting, and they flew in. It was crazy. Uh, buddies from Winnipeg, my aunt and uncle, a cousin from, uh, or my aunt and uncle from uh, Vancouver flew in, grandma, other aunts and uncles. It, so it was great. And then, you know, we all went to dinner after the game and it's just one of those really special days. It's the best. Uh, I, I, I guess as the clock is winding down, are you looking up going, I'm going to win my first NHL game and I'm likely going to post a shutout. Like, how does this happen to a guy that, couldn't get a start for five years in Ottawa. Wally, there's no way he's uttering shutout even in his mind. No, yes, you no, are. no, no. Tell, I, you are. It. Tell me right now. No you chance. Are. No ah! chance, Wally. I told you. <laughs> Honestly, I, I looked up at the clock and I was like, I can't look up at the clock. Like, I I can't think about <laughs> that. So I'm, I would like kind of be like my eyes would be itching to go up to the clock and I'd be like, no, 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 don't, <laughs> don't, look don't at do it. it. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I was trying with everything in me to not, not look at the clock. That's awesome. Uh, you're 21, eight and four as a starter in the National Hockey League. You own, you bookend your starts in Florida by posting a shutout in your last game as a member of the Florida Panthers um, as in the regular season. I, I guess, can you sum up your time in Florida? Because uh, I can't imagine when you think of how far you've come to now go, you know, I've started over 30 games in the National Hockey League. Yeah, I mean, Florida was great for me. They gave me the opportunities to have success and um, formed some great relationships with the guys and the coaches over there. Um, I had a blast. Uh, and yeah, I mean, it, it was just like, just one of those stepping stones where you have these two years and, and, uh, it would have been great to be back, but obviously, you know, there's, there's some issues that are, are some things that are just out of your control, but, yeah. uh, it was really, it was really incredible for me and to learn from a guy like Sergey Bobrovsky, he's, you know, one of the best to ever do it. So it was, um, it was definitely a, a, a high point in my, in my life, those two years. And that was kind of me um, proving to myself that, uh, that I was capable of playing at the NHL. So that was, uh, it was a long time coming. There was a lot of years where I didn't know if I was able to do it. You know, I was even having some success in Springfield and before in Binghamton or whatever, you know, you, you do well there for a little bit and you're like, well, can I do it at the NHL? Some guys can, some guys can't. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. But uh, no, that those years in Florida proved that for, for, for me and and just kind of gave me some confidence going going forward down the rest of the the line here in my career 
what's Bob like as a goalie, as in Sergei Bobrovsky? Sometimes starters don't want to spend a lot of time talking to the backups, or at least I've seen that in the past. I might be wrong. Uh, what's he like to deal with? He was awesome. Like, such an awesome, genuine guy. Um, <clears throat> he's, like, always so positive with me. Like, I've never sensed, you know, because there was times when, you know, he was maybe struggling a little bit. And they'd give me a couple starts and whatever. And I'd come back in and he'd just be like, you did a great job, man. You know, like you're really fun to watch. And like, it's me just starting out my career, you know, and to hear that from a two-time Vesna winner um, whose starts at that point you're taking, which I'm sure he doesn't like, but right. to just hear him say that is, is pretty incredible. And and we always had a great relationship and, um, you know, we had some great chats and, and uh, <laughs> had a couple of beers together at a rookie party last year and, and kind of got into some stories and stuff like that. So it's, it's just, it's just special to have those moments with a guy like that. And, and uh, it was funny. We talked about me developing my routine um, after Ottawa. And so I, you know, I'm like, all right, I need to get a better routine and whatever. I think I have it down pretty good. I, I walk into the room day one in Florida, Bob's been there an hour doing his routine <laughs> and then I do my full routine, which I think is great after. And then Bob's there for another like half hour after me doing his routine. I <laughs> looked at the mirror. I said, maybe I can add a little bit more to mine. <laughs> Uh, Philip Grubauer will be your, I guess, battery mate, if you will. Do you know uh, either him? Have you spent any time with him? Or do you know, did you know any of the other guys before they were uh, selected for Seattle? Um, so I actually just met Gruby for the first time today. Uh, he got in yesterday and he seems like a super nice guy. We chatted, you know, a bunch today. Um, so it seems like we're getting, I mean, it's still early, but I would imagine we're going to get along. I try, I try and get along with all my goalie partners. It just makes life way easier. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, no, he's good. I, I really like his game too. Actually, I've watched him for a while and, and uh, you know, see some similarities between his game and my game um, and just the way, like the style of play and stuff like that. So he'll be a cool guy um, to learn from too, because he's kind of been doing it a little bit longer than I have. So, um, so that's good. And then before the, or, uh, during the draft, there's only one guy I really knew well, uh, and that was that Joey Decord, who's also here, another goaltender. Yep. Um, I knew him from Ottawa. And then, uh, so I've been living in Boston the past two summers, training with him. Uh, his dad has a goaltending development company, oh, nice. Stop the Goaltending. So I've been skating with him. And yeah, so we, you know, gotten to know each other pretty well over the last two summers. So it's good to have some familiar faces. And then we ended up signing. Uh, Alexander Wenberg, who I played with in Florida last year. So that's another familiar face. Um, and then, yeah, just kind of been a lot of new faces um, every day at the rink because guys are kind of filtering in right now. So trying to learn the medical staff and the training staff and the equipment guys and all that stuff. So it's been, it's been a lot, but I'm, I'm trying my best over here. <laughs> uh, Joey Decord, uh, as friend of the show, uh, we watched his memorable first start and his win. Uh, did you guys ever talk about perhaps your first starts? I, I don't know if you ever exchanged texts over watching the two of you. Um, no, not our first starts. We, uh, cause yeah, cause he came in out of, um, out of college, right. And he got his first start in Ottawa. Yeah. Um, so no, we never talked about our first thought. I should say that we probably have a little bit, but his, I think was a bit of a different situation. He kind of brought, came in and they, they threw him in right away. Yeah. Um, but uh, we were talking a little bit this summer before the draft. We're like, oh, it'd be funny if we both ended up in Seattle, like kind of joking. And, and uh, <laughs> here we are. So <laughs> funny how that happens. It's such a small world, the hockey world. Uh, a couple of quick questions. Like, have you watched the movie Sleepless in Seattle? No, I haven't. <laughs> well, I, I got I, to I, now, though, right? It was the only movie I could think of with Seattle in it. Uh <laughs> One of the things we have is our, uh, what's your favorite snack? If you were to watch a movie, uh, do you have something that's a go-to cheat snack for you? Go-to cheat snack? Um, this is kind of off the board, but I love this stuff. You know, like, you ever have, like, real ramen? Ramen noodles? <laughs> yeah. Like, the real stuff? No. Unbelievable. What would be the difference between that and, like, a Udon noodle or something? So the Udons are just like thicker noodles. I'm, I'm oh, down right. The ramen are like really thin, right? They're the and then they have guys. this broth yeah. that's like so creamy and like, uh, it's, I love it. I'm okay. hooked. I had some yesterday. Now. Not even kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Did not see that coming. Um, oh, it's totally off the board. 
do you remember meth as much like what was he like was he grumpy to you as he is to everybody else yes probably <laughs> grumpy with everybody that was the opposite of grumpy when I was when I was in Ottawa. He was like, and I was just such a young guy coming in too. Like I was like 22, I think the first time I got called up. So, you know, like Chris Neal's giving me like the hardest time ever. And oh, like yeah. meth is surprise, just surprise, surprise. Yeah. Eh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like meth was always so like you were always so good to me. And like good. So it was nice to have that, you know, because coming in as such a young guy, like I had no idea what I was doing. Like yeah. no clue. So it's it's always nice to you know, have some friendliness from the guys. Well, so you're great for that. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah. And it's, it's it, cause I've been there, right? Like I, when I used to get called up to Columbus, I was drafted by them and you got the vets that just have no time of day for you. You got the yeah. ones that are at least kind of friendly. Like they'll at least say hi to you and acknowledge your presence. And then you get the nice ones that actually will communicate with you and have maybe tell you a story. And, and it's so uncomfortable, right? Like when you're a young guy and you can just feel like the, the heat from the negativity of some of the older guys. And it's so intimidating. I just, I don't have time yeah. for that. And I don't believe in that. Yeah, no, you were great. You were one of the third guys you mentioned for sure. So it was, well, it was great maybe, maybe that. not just, third guy. I gave it a second, maybe a no, second. No, no, you were I'll, good. You were always good okay. to me. So I, well, I thank, appreciate it. It was, it is, you. it is definitely makes for a better, uh, better feeling in the locker room. It just like allows you to do yeah. your job like Absolutely. at a higher level. So yeah. who's the most intimidating guy then in the Sens room to you? Was it Neeler or was it Fanuf? Oh, Dion for sure. Although Neil is pretty intimidating, <laughs> although Neil is pretty intimidating, but like Dion just he's he's got no time for you, <laughs> especially me. <laughs> he had zero time for me. Uh, he was a funny guy, like, and he just looks the part too. Like he's just yeah, he's got like, a constant yeah. scowl on his face, you <laughs> yeah, know. All and he's a and he's a teddy bear, man. That's the funniest part of this whole thing. Anyway, uh, we're gonna he have to show me, him this. He's gonna laugh. You know he reminds me of now is Roy from uh, Ted Lasso. Roy, Collins, oh, yeah. He's yeah, a little like, bit. Right, that hard shell, but underneath he's pretty soft on the inside. Uh, anyway, uh, Driggs, we like I've taken enough of your time, but we just wish you all the best this year in Seattle, and it's going to be fun. Obviously, I mean, I can't imagine the excitement that's in that city right now to watch you guys take to the ice. Yeah, it's been great. I mean, we've been walking around. The first time we were here, actually, just for uh, um, the draft, like six of us just kind of walked into this random, random bar, like just to grab a couple of drinks after after all the pandemonium was done and. The guy looks at us and says, ah, this rounds on me, boys. <laughs> so it's oh, like, no way. And so it was pretty That's cool. Awesome. Like just the city. Yeah. And like there's pop-up stores everywhere. I see guys, I see people in cracking gear everywhere. So it's just, it's, it's cool. The city is super excited. And like, we're, yeah, I mean, we're fired up for it. That first game is yeah. going to be, going to be wild. Good. We look well, forward good to luck. it too. So good luck this season. Uh, we, you know, as we cheered for you all along, we will cheer for you now to watch and see uh, how exciting that season is in Seattle, my friend. Uh, good luck. Yeah. Thanks fellas. Thanks for having me on. And as always, thanks again to Chris Drigger. All the best to him out there in Seattle. I uh, look forward to, you know what? I think those jerseys, by the way, look phenomenal. And I just saw a note as we welcome Craig into the show. Sorry, Craig. Yeah, is, yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> is they sold more jerseys in like a 24-hour period or a two-day period than Vegas did in like the first two months or something like that? Mm. Like their jersey sales have been through the roof. So anyway, lo lots of support out there in Seattle. I look forward to seeing how their season goes. Uh, Craig, hi. Hey guys, what's going on? I, I was, I almost barged in earlier when you guys, uh, you guys were talking about Jack Eichel. Uh, but I don't know if you saw just, just this morning, Buffalo took the, the C off of Jack Eichel. Oh. So that seems Ooh. to be, seems to be uh, kind of falling apart there. I guess there's still some uh, contentious around his, what surgery he should do. The Matthew brought that up, the fusion or whatever else. So I think if you did have concerns about Jack Eichel, I think they are still probably pretty valid, but uh, it seems like he probably may not be in Buffalo much longer so well they had to they had to they had to strip up like they, you can't your captain who by the way very clearly does not want to play there at this point at least it looks that way doesn't want to do the recommended surgery by the team which i don't know enough about so i can't judge him on that but if he's your captain i mean i feel like kevin adams had no choice i think the buffalo sabers made the right decision there i mean it's the, the whole situation is a big dumpster fire but you can't allow a player like that to be your captain sitting out. It sends the wrong message to the rest of the group. So it's a tough thing to do. It's a big distraction. And I'm sure media is going to run with this badly today now, and it's going to be a bit of a blemish, but it will blow over and they'll move on from it. That's interesting. I, I, I know three big instances where I've covered, I guess, captain season. That was Alexi Yashin, but he held out. And so they gave it to Alfie. And then Alexi came back. And I just remember asking Alfie like, 
hey, uh, any chance that you're going to give the C back to you? Yeah. She's like, no. So that was over pretty quick. Um, I do remember, though, Eric Lindros with Philadelphia. He had the contract issues. They were in Ottawa. And all of a sudden, I get tapped on the shoulder in the afternoon. And they're like, come with us. I'm like, what? They wanted, they were so mad at Eric Lindros. They allowed us to come in and film or record them putting the C on Eric Desjardins jersey. Like, make sure you get a shot of this. And I'm like, wow. They, they could not have been more pissed off with Eric Lindros. Like, could you imagine to, to, to a national media member going, hey, we want to make sure that you see us doing oh, and, this. And, and Wally, I'm sure you went in there licking your chops, just Ooh. thinking, oh boy, this is an exclusive. <laughs> I'm like, I like, great. I, I, but you're kind of like stunned. You're like, how bad no, no. are you know you know what like what's going on behind the scenes that they're this yeah. bad and the other one was uh Eric, uh in tampa they took the sea off vincent lecavalier and it was in a preseason game so they come into ottawa and uh i remember just ian mendez and i are standing next to each other and i go to torts and no one really wants to ask questions and i was like uh torts i want to talk to you about your relationship with obviously uh, vincent lecavalier taking the sea off why do I have to come to Canada to find out about my own team? Can't we have any discussions without you guys? And I'm like, okay, I'm just asking towards. I'm just yeah. asking. I feel, like so if you, I, I feel like if you strip a player of, of, of the C, of the captaincy, yeah. that it, you just sever any relationship you have with that player and you have to part ways. Like, I think yeah. we've seen it happen a couple of times in recent history. I think with Dustin Brown in LA, didn't he forfeit the captaincy, but, but willingly yep. did it on yep. his own. And, but think, but yeah. that's how, but that's an amicable situation that doesn't right. happen very often, but that's the way it has to go down. Otherwise, if you're forcing the player's hand, I mean, you're just, any relationship you had with that captain is now gone and you're going to have to move them. But that's the problem. I am. I agree with you, but in Tampa, but, it worked. And maybe because you have I, to have that kind of special player where well, in Tampa, he's a hall of famer no, type guy. Yeah. And, and what player in the right mind would leave a, a good team in Tampa Bay, Florida to yeah. go elsewhere. I mean, it, that's an exception because of Tampa Bay and the location. And it's one of the most sought after places to play in the national hockey league. But if you're in Buffalo and the sea gets stripped off that Jersey of yours, you were on a one-way flight out of that city. <laughs> yeah, no offense yeah. to the good folk in Buffalo, but I'm just saying there is a significant difference there. It's the elephant in the room here. And when the team's not even playing well or doing well on top of all of that tough situation. I, I, I do. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I do remember there have been instances where players have asked to not wear the C anymore. They've gone. You know, and that's what? good. That just that's happened. Good. Actually. That happened oh, with uh, 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 Panarin in uh, the Rangers. They, someone asked him oh, about right. them not having a captain and he just kind of basically yeah. said, like, there's probably better people than me. And so, good for uh, him. Yeah, and good for I, him. I, he's just probably not that kind of leader, right? Like some guys, no. they're not they're not captains, right? Even though they well, may I, be the best player on the team, but they're probably not a captain leader. Yeah, right? and that's what people I, – I think a lot of people are starting to understand that, but like your captain's not necessarily your most skilled player. It's, it's your leader and vocal guy in the room that isn't shy to speak up and go to the coaching staff when there are issues. Those are the guys you need wearing your letters. And uh, Dorian talked about that yesterday, right? During his, uh, his thing, right, that they were going to wait – probably until mid season is this is the plan just like this no, is I mean, the, this is all tied else, to brady right how like, else how else is pierre and you can't blame pierre like he's doing his job and you can't you can't commit to it in a presser yeah. and say well yeah we're gonna give it to brady as soon as he signs like first of all that's very unprofessional and that'll never come out of his mouth but i think we all know what's happening here and he's just deflecting really tough questions and i, I mean i'd probably do the same thing he's not deflecting them they're handling this completely terribly who is handling it terribly? The Senators. You've come out okay. and said, we're not going to give the captaincy to a guy that's on a bridge deal. Or well, that not. wasn't, so, that wasn't, no, that was Eugene. Eugene said that, that. That was the owner. He's a member of the Ottawa Senators. Okay, no, I understand point. that. But I, so okay, now, but I'm talking about the guys that are They're completely there on the handcuffed. Yeah. So for him, so for Pierre now to go, you know what? We might wait to decide what we're going to do midseason means I need to find out what Brady's going to do. So let's just stop talking about the captaincy because how can you give it to Thomas Shabbat now? You've already said, Thomas, if we give this to you, you, you are our second choice. Yeah, I know. No, no. It's, but that's, that's not on them. It's just a really, I feel like I do understand what, what you're saying, Wally, but I, I do feel like it's just coincidentally just bad timing because Brady's contract happens to be up. They happen to need a captain and he happens to be the guy who's ready to be the captain and he's not signed yet. So I think it's just, it's a, just a bit of a cluster and they can't control that. And 
I feel like Pierre probably won't have to answer too many of those questions now that he's addressed it. It's awkward, but it's just, it's the stark reality of what he's dealing with right now. Uh, I don't think they can give it to Thomas Shabbat. I think it's an insult to him if they do, because you're, you're and, you know, clearly and, the and number I wanted, two. And I wanted to add this one last thing, because Shabby can be your captain. He is such a mm, well-spoken, yes. um, um, you know, he's got that right attitude where he's not maybe as colorful as Brady goes, but but he's a guy that I feel like is a legitimate leader in that locker room. And there's been so much name throwing around with Brady just because he's Brady and he's a little more gregarious on the ice. He's got the personality. So people assume he's that guy, but I feel like you couldn't go wrong with Thomas Shabbat either. He is clear. He, he technically could be your clear cut captain as well. I just, I feel like we need to acknowledge that because we keep glossing over it. I was, uh, for the start of last year, if, if not before that leading up to probably halfway through last year was on team uh, Thomas to, to be the captain, his maturity right. level, the way he conducts himself. Uh, the fact he speaks two languages, wrote French yeah. and English, right. Is a huge, he just, he's the complete package of everything you wanted to be in a leader. Yeah. They just happen to have a guy in Brady Kachuk who's probably the heart and soul. So it makes it tougher, but on any other team, I think Thomas Shabbat is the captain. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, one last thing I wanted to touch on boys and we'll get to some trivia here, but uh, Angus Crookshank got hurt in the uh, rookie games over the weekend done for four to six months they said yesterday uh oh, we've seen that a couple tough. times now in the past few years where guys just get their big long injuries right at the beginning of training camp it happened with Lillian a couple of years ago and uh, a year or two before that with Pajot in Ottawa um I'll ask both of you guys what do you Matt as a, as a teammate what do you do to you lose a guy he, he trains all summer gets ready for training camp and then he's done for months and he's in rehabbing and kind of completely derails especially a guy like Crookshank this is a development year for him right so what do you what do you do to keep a guy like that keep his at it his his attitude positive and his spirits up I mean a lot of these guys are already fairly mentally strong players right to get to this level to get to the level where you're even able to try out for an NHL hockey club means you do have you know, a little bit of mental toughness and you're able to get through stuff like this, a little adversity comes your way. Um, and I think as players, you rally around him a little bit, but I don't know that he even needs that. I know that, I, well, first I can speak on an organization like Ottawa. They have so many good people working behind the scenes with them, the training staff there with, with Jerry Town in the background with, with Dom Nicoletta and, and Sean Markwick, who does a lot of good, good work as well. And then of course, Chris Schwartz, the strength coach, they've got great people that'll guide him through this. And, you feel for him anytime there's a major injury like that, especially as you said, Craig, in training camp, no less. You, you can't even get out of the gate. That sucks. There's no way around it. You just got to put your put your nose down and grind and get through it, come back strong and prepared, and hopefully he'll get an opportunity in the later stages of the season, assuming there are some injuries. Well, Matt, the one thing that you can relate to, and that is when you are a long rehab, you're not around anybody. And that's the one thing I remember players always talking about never getting yeah. a chance to hang out with their teammates. They Sucks. come in when everybody else is gone. So they're like isolated. Yeah. And I always remember the guys will always say that's number one is the hardest thing is to just yeah. not feel like you're a member of the team. Well, and, and I went through it, especially in Dallas with my knee, Oh man, like, because especially if you're not really familiar with a lot of the players, you're not super close yet with these guys. Cause you haven't really spent a ton of time with them. It's very difficult because you just kind of feel like an outsider all the time. You're coming to the arena, the arena, excuse me, much earlier. You're yeah. typically leaving while they're on the ice practicing. So you're never really around them. You're kind of working around them all the time, right? So you're not really able to socialize. So for months on end, if you're out, it can get, you do feel isolated and you start developing bonds more with the training staff than you do with the players. You get tight with them because you're always around them, right? And so it's, it's something that's difficult to navigate around, but it's inevitable. If you're hurt and it's out long-term, they don't want you around the players as much because, you know, they, they don't want players seeing that, you know, the, sometimes per, the perception looks like you're just enjoying yourself and you're on a vacation, which of course you're not, but it mm -hmm. comes across that way when the guys are coming off the road, maybe on a, a week and a half road trip to practice the next day at home. And they're really tired and you're sitting there in the hot tub laughing with the trainers. So they try to separate you from the group and it's very common in all sports. It's very difficult, but it's something you just have to work through. Perfect. Um, yeah. One thing uh, we'll, we'll touch on here before we go, you guys talked about Sokolov wearing the gear uh, during his interview, which I didn't know that was coming either. So that got a good laugh out of me, but if you're out there and you do want to grab some of this stuff for yourself, Brent mentioned it earlier, head on over to gongshow.com, grab your latest fit uh, hats, hoodies, t-shirts. In fact, we're going to give away a hat and a t-shirt today as part of uh, trivia from our dear friends at gong show. If you can answer 
this question about Chris Drieger. He played so so little time for the Ottawa Senators. How, how many minutes did, did Chris Drieger play for the Ottawa Senators? If you know the answer to that, head on over to Twitter. Use the hashtag Wally Mathot and be sure to tag at Gong Show Gear on Twitter. Send us your answer and we will announce the winner on our next show. Fred, do we know when that is yet? Next Coming week? Monday. Monday? Okay, perfect. Nice. Monday afternoon. Nice. We're going to have Ian Mendez joining us Ooh. at 4 o'clock live. Perfect. Well, actually, I haven't asked Matt yet, but are you busy at four? <laughs> <laughs> Let me check my schedule. I'll get back to you. <laughs> uh, we will see you live on Monday at four, uh, with, the, with or without Matt. Uh, we'll see you then, boys. Take care. You're watching the Wally Mathot Show, powered by Barhaven Ford. Time for us to drive on out of here.